conducting a series of interviews with farmers and fishermen. And an exhibit is, is coming up in 2014 called Farmers and Fishers, Portraits, Words, and Tools. So as part of that, what I'd like to do is share with you uh, some of the writing that I've done and uh, some of the images that I've collected. Uh, many of these images, this not being one of them, have come from the archives of the Whaling Museum through the old Dartmouth collection, which I think you had a chance to visit as part of your uh, program. Um, so my talk is entitled The Changing Dynamics of Agriculture. And as part, what I'm going to do is look at the historical precedent for sustainability today. Um, so it went on to once we're settled is uh, to begin actually from the text that I've written for a book which is going to be coming out in 2014. Farmsteads. There was a time when each village of Old Dartmouth were villages of friends who worked together to build the community through hard work, equity, and reliance for the common in community. Their farms, workplaces, and homes followed the daily cycles of the seasons as in nature, they reused everything and found their own niche to a follow for the good of their family, neighbors, and community. Uh, this is the Crapo Farmstead on Gulf Road in Dartmouth. In our grandparents' day, the farmers always had extra produce, often had roots that they followed to bring the precious produce uh, to the village families. It was the vegetable wagon the egg man and the milk man who made the weekly rounds. Shops carried fresh and cured meat from the local farms, cheese from the local dairy, produce from the local farms, and flowers from the local gardens. The local economy kept our neighbors flush with cash to spend on other goods from the village green. Our grandparents had a local green economy. Why can't we? This is a barnyard in Dartmouth. This spirit can enliven the community, again, by integrating sustainability and green economy uh, into our daily lives, actions, and work, like our grandparents lived as stewards on the land. Our farming grandparents uh, lived low. Oh. and timbered the trees from the woods and dug the stone from their fields to build homes and boundary walls. Farm animals grazed the land. Sheep were shorn for wool. Every house had a loom for weaving cloth and making coverlets and blankets for the long winter. This is Bald Hill, which is Horseneck Road East. As they prospered, barns, coops, smokehouses, and stables were built and all of the rainwater was channeled from the roofs into the central cistern to water the animals in the gardens. They protected their springs and wells and conserved water. For example, the house on the right with a large barn, all of the water was funneled from that into a central cistern between the main house and the barn. And uh, they did use that for watering their animals in the gardens. What you see on the left-hand side is um, a, uh, an egg farm in the earlier phase where you had the smaller coops with the heavily uh, with the, uh, with the uh, pointed roof lines uh, adjacent to the stone walls and the building closest to us is an ice house uh, with the a pond that was uh, used for ice frozen in winter cut and stored in that barn um, when the days when uh, 
horse and, and buggy and carriage uh, was, was the, the norm. Pantry. The garden seeds were brought and planted and seeds saved for replanting next year. Their vegetables were preserved, pickled, and stored in their pantry. Corn and other grains were milled in local water and wind-powered grist mills. Apples from their orchards could be dried, made into cider and hard cider, or left to sweeten over the winter in oak barrels, along with the winter squash and onions in cold storage. Carrots, turnips, and parsnips filled their root cellars. They built a smokehouse, a stone smokehouse, to prepare their meats, and salted fish to fill their larder. The farm kitchen. Flax was grown for fiber to make linen for summer clothing and tablecloths. Hemp fiber was used for rope. Neighbors helped with walls, bond raisings, boat launchings, and harvest. Neighbors lent a helping hand for each other's births, weddings, and deaths. There were cobblers, tinsmiths, and blacksmiths. The ice house. A communal pond was used for ice, which was stored in an ice house filled with sawdust. They made do. They lived close to the land. Their farmland may have sloped to the bay. Here a shack was built behind the dunes. The salt marsh hay was harvested for their dairy cows' fodder. Seaweed was used in the gardens, and shellfish were harvested from the bay. The fishing shacks on Westport, on Horseneck Beach in Westport. They built a skiff for fishing. They waited for herring in the spring, striped bass in summer, and eels were caught in the upper river and streams year-round. Natives taught them how to catch frost fish in the winter. They never went hungry. They only caught what they needed to see them through another season. They lived light on the land. And just as a postscript to this, I'll mention that now um, mackerel, for example, frost fish smelts are no longer found in these waters. They're functionally extinct. The water temperature has risen beyond their tolerance level. Uh, for example, Buzzard, Buzzard's Bay this summer in August, it was over 72 degrees Fahrenheit. And their tolerance for, say, the mackerel is uh, in the upper 60s. So what had been a tradition is a lost tradition. And not only are the species gone, but so aren't the fishermen who followed it. They're dying like the uh, fish that they pursued. Our grandparents knew how to live with nature. Today, we ask you to think about how our community of New Dartmouth can rediscover the green to make our village green once again. How can we do this? Let us look to the past to find a precedent for the future. Village industry. The salt works. The village had a salt works on the shore powered with small windmills to draw up the seawater and solar to evaporate the salt. Each stretch of farms used the power of the wind and water to grind and mill their corn and grains for flour. There were grist mills and sawmills. Our grandparents used renewable energy for local industrial and commercial production. Why can't we? Now this is on the road to uh, Nonquit, and what you see here is the brushworks. It was quite an extraordinary structure because inside was filled with literally with brush. And what they did is they used the windmills to pump the water up from the bay. Um, it went through this brushworks vertically and it dissipated the water quickly. It evaporated to make salt because salt was an, a commodity that couldn't really be imported. They had to make their own and they did. And it's fairly ingenious because they actually had a, a mechanisms for lifting those roofs off and drying the salts. You can see that uh, the salt uh, pans in the front, and these are really good size, um, and the brushworks in the back. And you can see how the water sort of channeled through the system. Um, this is, if you know uh, Dartmouth, that's paint and arrow. Transportation, trains, and trolleys. In earlier times, Old Westport Road in Dartmouth was part of a network of public access routes served by stagecoach. The 18th century inn and tavern at the base of the campus was a stagecoach stop. 
I'll, I'll show this to you in a bit. In the old days, two horses pulled the coach, coach with another two added when the roads were muddy or covered with snow. Mm -hmm. In time, the horses were replaced um, with, uh, by a motorized vehicle, which was still called the stage. The coach started every morning in Little Compton at, at 6.30 a.m. and arrived in New Bedford at 10.30 a.m. The return trip departed New Bedford at 3. And what the people used to do is, uh, along the route is they would say, um, give the laundry to the stagecoach operator, uh, operator to take to New Bedford and then bring it back clean at the, the second stage. So it was a very heavily utilized um, uh, service. Trains connected Boston to New Bedford on the Union uh, Street Railroad. In the 19th century, horse-drawn trolleys ran from New Bedford through Dartmouth on what was now Route 6, is now Route 6 to Fall River on the Dartmouth and Westport Street Railway before they were electrified. On Route 6 run, the popular attraction was Lincoln Park, um, built by the Union Street Railway after they took over the Dartmouth and Westport Street Railway around 1905. The heyday of the trolleys was in the early 1900s, but was soon to come to a screeching halt. By 1947, the Union Street Railway stopped all trolley service. And I'll show you the lack of con connectivity in comparison to what had been uh, through uh, the 1940s uh, for public transportation. After World War II, America industrialized and the automobile replaced the train and trolley systems. Uh, the network of rural route trains were dismantled. Highways were being constructed. Route I-95, Route 24, Route 88, and Route 177 opened up the south coast to commuters of the baby boom generation, replaced the village variety stores with malls and farm fields with housing. Suburbanization continued through the 21st century until the housing bubble burst and the economy floundered. Mills. Uh, according to the historian Henry B. Worth, the first necessity in colonial settlement was food, the second shelter. For each need, a mill was required to convert the raw corn and grains to flour and, and forest to be sawn into lumber. The streams were harnessed for um, a water power, and the coastal winds captured where water power was unavailable for the grinding of flint corn and other grains. Dartmouth. I want you to take a look at this um, early map because it's showing you the topography of the site. Um, what's interesting is that you had the earliest villages um, uh, located where you had the uh, strongest rivers and streams for a uh, car and for water power for the mills. And if you were to look at that and sort of geographically, uh, geologically, what you would see, if you spread your fingers of your hand, you have a series of ridges. Upon the ridges were built the roads from the earliest native period, uh, then colonized, and then continued and paved uh, to today. And in between your fingers of your hand were, were the watersheds of the river valleys. There the mills were built. And as you get to the tip of your fingers, that's where the windmills were. Um, so there was a very strong use of, of natural um, features in order to, to power and service the, uh, the community over time. Let's see. Old Dartmouth had 20 villages but no town center. The tendency was to accommodate every neighborhood and to utilize all available water power. Mill Dam and Stream. Great timber swamps of Atlantic white cedar, swamp white oak, and white pine cover the northern part of the town. Natural resources and expanding population created a demand for lumber mills to supply wood for home construction and shipbuilding. The water wheel operating the actual uh, structure of the grist mill. In this case, you can see there's a turbine um, operating. 
which is the evolution of power. You can see this Aquarius grist mill actually in Adamsville, Rhode Island, Dan. of the uh, Grace Grist Mill, which I, I recommend you visit if you're interested. And then this is over at the Allen's Mill, which I think that that's called Slocum, is that Slocum Road? That's, it's, it's near Russell's Mills. Mm -hmm. it's, a, uh, um, it's a DNRT property. Now take a look at this, because this is our neighborhood at UMass Dartmouth. Uh, this was called Smith Mills, and this is from an 1856 Walling map. And if you look at this, take a look at this, the village community here, because we're talking about a self-sufficient uh, community with blacksmith shop, a competing blacksmith shop, a school, number 10, a wheelwright shop, another wheelwright shop, a uh, friend's church, so this was a Quaker community, um, um, another mill, a stone mill, there's the Cummings mill, um, a shoe shop, and more, you can see how the neighborhoods developed and the sense of village uh, was created at each of these um, centers in Dartmouth of Smith Mills. This is the Smith Mills once again. Um, so if you can compare that to today, you find an almost desert of, in suburban Dartmouth right now. Um, there are no services. As a resident of, of UMass Dartmouth, um, you have to get in your car to drive, whereas in this time, everything was there. It was self-contained. And we may find ourselves going back to the future um, and because of the costs of transportation and the need to have things sort of sustainably operating. Uh, and this is a, a grist mill right on Route 6. It's where the gas station and the pawnbroker is um, at the end of, I think that's Tucker Road. <coughs> and then, and the unfortunate thing about that, that past mill is that it was taken down block by block, granite block by granite block. Mm -hmm. Nobody wanted the granite that ended up in the town dump. And then this was a water powered sawmill um, on the opposite side of, of uh, Route 6. Right as you come up from UMass Dartmouth, from Old Westport Road, um, gone, gone. Um, Henry B. Worth states, the number of mills in the town was considerable, and yet not generally known how numerous. It is certain there must have been at least 99 separate mills previous to the introduction of steam, of which 11 were windmills. Beside those mills, which ground corn and grain and others that sawed lumber, there are mills that manufactured iron in various stages and fully in carding mills for wool and in later years for cotton. Henry B. Worth continues, and he is a scholar that you really ought to look up. Uh, if you were to go to the old Dartmouth archives, for example, which you can even do online, take a look at his writings because he's one of the most accurate um, historians that paint the past for you. Uh, so he's really, he's used as a, as a resource and as a scholar um, that you can quote. Um, the only material used for that purpose was, uh, every being worth continues with mills of Old Dartmouth. Previous to 1860, cotton was not used. The only material used for that purpose was sheep's wool. Three processes were employed in manufacturing wool and cloth. At first, it was necessary to clean the wool by combing and form it into rolls about 12 inches long and one inch in diameter. Huh. Uh, one inch in diameter. This was called carding and required dexterity rather than physical strength. Consequently, this process was performed exclusively by hand uh, previous to 1811, and no mills were devoted to this part of the manufacturer. In November 1811, at White's factory at Akushnet, carding machinery was set up. Right there. Uh, oh, this is um, 
was set up, and later years at Russell's Mills, Robert Gifford had a carding mill which was in operation until the Civil War. These are the only enterprises which are devoted to that branch of manufacture, except that of William Gordon, Jr., and one of the head of Westport mentioned hereafter. The second stage of cloth manufacture was the spinning and carding rolls of yarn and thread. This was simple and easy, and like the process proceeding, it required skill rather than physical power. Consequently, it was performed mostly by women in their homes. There were no mills devoted to spinning of yarn or thread. Uh, this is of the early textile mill workers. The third stage was the manufacture of yarn into cloth. This involved physical labor, and while hand looms were operated by men and women, there were several mills where it was done by machinery operated by water power. These were called fulling mills. How early such mills were established in Dartmouth cannot be stated with certainty. In 1702, Return Bob of Babcock mortgaged his mill privilege at the village, later known as Smith Mills, and included a fulling mill, which was located on the north side of the highway. This privilege had been developed nearly 40 years previous. The mills were located at that point in 1681, and it cannot be asserted when the cloth mill was started and the fulling mill is last mentioned in 1775. And in terms of uh, looking at how you go from a village home spun industry into a, a factory setting, you can see an evolution of technology that allowed for the manufacture of thread and cloth, so this is a non quit spinning company, they grew into national and international operations, the Dartmouth Mills. And now I'd like to talk about the evolution to today of these mills, many of which are vacant. Uh, this is the Durfee and Union Mill in Fall River. And here, uh, this was once the largest cotton mill complex in Fall River. The Durfee Union Mills have been adapted as a medical center and host a small entrepreneurial business, including urban acres. What's quite amazing is that on the third floor of a set of, of wide stairs with, a, with a, a cast iron treads that say Durfee Union Mills with a date on it, um, that you have to climb up because you don't trust, trust the old elevator, um, is a hydroponic operation that's called Urban Acres. And here, in the winter, they grow under lights uh, peppers, bell peppers, jalapeno peppers, tomatoes, cucumbers. For a, uh, a wide market, they supply the Lee's Market in Westport, and they also supply uh, the Back Eddy and uh, Bayside restaurants with herbs and lettuce, wow. and uh, with uh, fresh tomatoes and cucumbers in the dead of winter. And they had a CSA last year. So what's interesting in this is that it's a completely soilless process. And what they're doing is they are, um, they're doing frontier agriculture in the city. It's vertical agriculture, because everything is sort of stacked up floor to ceiling. Mm -hmm. And so uh, it, it is energy intensive, but what they do is they, they are setting solar on the roof to, uh, to help to power it. Um, so you may see uh, the reuse of some of these mills to bring agriculture back into the city wow. year round. Uh, so that's one possibility. Now what they're doing is they are, uh, they've moved from the third floor to the first floor now. This is the first floor, so that it's a little easier access. So uh, what you're seeing is an adaptive reuse um, and uh, urban agriculture, uh, which creates a synergy um, that will help to revitalize Fall River, potentially. What you're looking at here is Alderbrook Farm. It's a multi-generational centennial farm. Five generations of the same family have maintained this. And what they do is they, not only are they growing, but they act as brokers for the other farm farmers. Um, this is at Russell's Mills. And that's his pet oxen, um, who actually, I think, could plow the fields if allowed. 
Um, and this is a seascape at Stony Meadow Farm, a gym monger, and it's showing how hydroponics can be used in a greenhouse setting as well. Um, he uses a very mild fertilizer organic solution. He grows out strawberries, he grows out luscious raspberries. You can believe how large these raspberries are, both golden and red, as well as uh, uh, hydroponic tomatoes. And he supplies to local businesses. What's, if you want to look at the, the changing dynamics of agriculture, you can sort of think of the old school farmers, um, like John George, Sr. You had to be a botanist, you had to be a gardener, you had to be a soil scientist, a meteorologist, a mechanic, an inventor, salesman, an accountant, to keep the farm, family farm running smoothly. Farmers were multidisciplinary Renaissance men and women. Today, uh, many of the other farmers share their knowledge with the next generation in an oral history network that spans the South Coast. Today, uh, the farms tend to be fragmented and run by well-educated and directed farmers who create sustainable business plans and follow them to reach their goals. There's one farm, not too far from here, um, that stands as an example of blending science with agriculture. Uh, Derek Christensen, as you can see in the photo, and his family operate Briggs Bounty Farm in Dartmouth. It's on Tucker Road, in case you're not familiar with it. Uh, it's 858 Tucker Road, uh, Dartmouth. He offers fresh vegetables and education. Um, uh, Derek works the soil biodynamically to improve the soil fertility and uh, nutritional value. Yep. Please. I don't know why it's coming loose. Okay, let's, let's stay. Um, and um, he offers a seasonal CSA, a roadside stand, farmers markets, and educational programs promoting sustainable agriculture. In the reflective winter months, uh, Derek hosts self-help classes for local farmers. Uh, who read the latest literature on permaculture and soil remediation and share their experiences of farming through the seasons. Mm -hmm. uh, Complementing Brick Bounty's farm's mission, Derek consults with other farms to build their soil uh, quality and mineral content of the soil to improve vegetable and crop nutrition. Derek, like many of the other new breed of farmers, opens the frontiers of agriculture to new possibilities on the South Coast. Now, what you should know is that a lot of the, uh, the vegetables that you're buying in the markets these days are essentially been stripped of vitamins and minerals. Um, there is a way of building it back in. One is to use heritage breeds of seeds, from seed savers, for example, and uh, the other is to improve the soil, to build up the soil that then goes into the vegetables that you eat. So you can improve the nutrition through soil fertility, for example. Um, and that's what Derek is preaching. And uh, I think that they had a program uh, as part of the, the, um, the Marion Institute's programs on this as well. Nutrition and, and fertility go hand in hand. And we're losing both, unfortunately, with, with corporate controlled agriculture. So this is Heflin Farm, where you as students can actually uh, become uh, members and have a garden plot if you wanted. Um, that's also on, um, I believe that's on Chase Road. Now, uh, this is, if you consider the idea of the, um, of, of the village and the homestead that we saw in the first, in the first slides. Um, well, what you see here is a new vision of, of the agricultural homestead. And what you're looking at is Round the Bend Farm. And here, the Marion Institute, which is an international foundation um, that deals with um, um, agri agriculture, uh, sustainability in foreign countries as well as, as in this country um, and are having a whole weekend 
which you may or may not be aware of, um, in New Bedford, they're revitalizing New Bedford with a whole series of programs. I had Jim Hansen was talking about climate change this morning, for example, will be workshops all the way through the weekend utilizing various sites in New Bedford, which is sort of critical if you're going to revitalize a city. Round the Bend Farm is a test case. It is a, a modern day farmstead. Um, they are investing not only in uh, the land, they're building an educational center, they're growing vegetables that they supply to uh, local brokers, um, going all the way to uh, Rhode Island, uh, um, uh, to, to Boston, for example, with their organic vegetables, but they also have um, a meat CSA. They have sheep, they have uh, uh, Angus, they have different types of uh, milking cows, they have chickens that, uh, that supply the CSA. So this, you can say, um, is a blend of sustainable farming and education. Um, this is Fred Dabney at Quonset Nurseries. He is another new frontiersman of, uh, of agriculture. Fred um, grows what's called microgreens in his greenhouses. They're essentially tiny, just the, just the buddings of the plant that you grow out, and they're intense in flavor. So if you had, say, the, there's a one called, I think, cracked corn or something, and it is so corny, it's unbelievable, it's, it's so wow. good, and the chefs love it. Um, so he, she uses the broker, Sid Wainer, in uh, New Bedford, and they ship all over to some of the top um, restaurants in the area. And that is um, Rose, adjacent to it, adjacent to him. She is a chef. And uh, uh, so what I should say is that a farmer today um, has to have a certain business acumen, has to be creative, has to be ingenious and they have to develop new markets for their products. And they have to add value through invention, and they also have to collaborate with chefs to highlight their produce. So this is Chef Rosa Galino. She's a real Italian powerhouse. Um, you go into her kitchen um, to take a photograph, she puts you to work. Three hours later, after peeling onions, she releases you, you know, and, uh, but what happened here is all of this produce uh, came into the Grange in Dartmouth for a Circle of Friendship farm-to-table dinner and live auction at Alderberg Farm. And I did this poster to show with all of the hands passing the vegetables or shaking Rose's hand to show that circle uh, of synergy and collaboration between the chef and the farmers. Mm -hmm. um, this summer, 38 farms across the south coast of Cape Cod provided oysters, cherry stone plants, cheeses, bread, blossoms, greens, herbs, vegetables of every flavor, shape, and color, mussels, fish, Berkshire hog, Jordan Farm beef, Johnny Take meal, eggs, fruits, honey, and flowers to enable renowned chef Rosa Glano and a host of tireless volunteers, myself included, uh, to create a memorable seven-course celebration of summer within the commercial kit of kitchens of the Dartmouth Grange. Yeah. And so uh, the Dartmouth Grange, I should mention, also opens up their kitchens to local entrepreneurs who are making everything from granola to breads to pickles that they market in local <coughs> stores in New York. So uh, once again, it's how to reinvent the farming and find new, new markets. The farmers and their guests toasted the season in each other as the CMAP farm to table evening unfolded at Alderberg Farm, a bucolic five generation centennial farm run by the Manley uh, family. Um, the male squash blossoms emerge from cool storage at Eva's Garden, and if you ever have a chance, you should have a field trip to Eva's Garden. She's quite remarkable because it's like Monet's garden. It's in Dartmouth, and she grows for chefs who come out and pick and woo and ah uh, at all the beautiful edible flowers and variegated vegetables and the colors and shapes and the taste are just incredible. And um, so she opened up her cooler to pull out all of these squash blossoms that Rosa took uh, to create uh, a tempura 
a syrup with a flavorful uh, microgreens from Fred Dab near Quonset Nursery. And uh, just to show you how there's a whole network of farms, mussels arrive from the Wellfish of Wellfleet Shellfish Company. They are transformed into a consomme of herbs and garlic. A salad greens of every shape, color, and flavor were topped with edible orange nasturtiums. The grass-fed Jordan beef became a complex and delicious meatball, tasting of veal, paired with handmade ravioli stuffed with Shy Brothers Clumage. A Berkshire hog from Miss Scott's <coughs> Suburban Farm swam in moonshine sauce, care of Bully Boy Distillery. A situate dogfish marinated overnight in St. Aura's clam broth, and spices became a cassoulet served with chocolate mint, herbed bull's blood beets, and sauteed greens. Desserts followed from a decadent flourless chocolate torte to art artisan bake shop rhubarb strawberry and blueberry johnny cake crumble with lavender served with Jim's organic coffee or Westport Rivers vineyard and winery dessert wines. Wow. <laughs> yes, we're quite a meal. Um, they had to wheel us out of carts you know, at the end or stretchers. The, from farm to table was truly a memorable celebration of the ingenuity of our local farmers to join hands in friendship with a talented chef to fet the public. Farm to table events across the South Coast encourage us to support our local farmers by buying fresh local produce to prepare real food uh, for our family and friends. Poultry. Historic poultry on the South Coast. We're gonna go back to this one for a minute. Poultry was the second most important business in Dartmouth and Westport. The first was dairy. Um, the Rhode Island Red Chicken was developed in Adamsville, Rhode Island, where a large bronze plaque commemorates their origin. The Rhode Island Red Chicken has served as the primary producer of brown eggs since 1840. Every farm in the region had chicken coops, with their family used them for commerce. A drive along the back roads of the South Coast reveals the two-story rectangular coops in various states of decay throughout the region. This is Horse Chestnut Poultry Farm. Horse Chestnut Poultry Farm in Southwestport was founded in 1885 uh, by E.G. Gifford. There's nothing left except it's now a horse farm. Um, his specialty was selling day-old chicks, which were brooded and hatched and shipped in perfectly made boxes, made locally, uh, to farms and homesteads in New England. The farm started by raising Plymouth Rock chickens, which are then replaced by the more productive, profitable, and vigorous Rhode Island red chickens. The price quoted from the January 1928 Horse Chestnut Farm catalog was $25 per 100 chicks, shipped parcel pros or express on the earliest train for same day delivery in March, April, or May. The Horse Neck Farm, uh, Horse Neck Road Farm hosted nine to 10,000 disease-free brooders each year to hatch the eggs. The railroads connected Dartmouth to Westport, to New Bedford, and Fall River to Boston, and to Cape Cod in a network of train and trolley tracks through the 1940s, allowing the farmer to ship to the consumer efficiently. Testimonials from Nantucket to Taunton to Tunbridge, Vermont, attest to the vigor and breeding of this L.H. Farr strain of Rhode Island red chickens raised in Westport. Dear Mr. Gifford, I have got my chickens, and nice ones they are. I never saw chickens sent out in nicer boxes. Everyone was warm and nice. Here I am again, sent you another money order for the last 200 checks. Now I'm going to write you a friendly letter about my chickens, of course, of which I am so proud. I hatched 135 of my own and put them in the same brooder as your 300 making 435, which will be four weeks old tomorrow. I've lost seven that died on the star. The rest are all well and happy. A lot of people have been by to see them and are still coming. They're the best I've ever had. Sincerely yours, Rose Walling, Harrisville, Rhode Island. So if you were to compare the connectivity of, uh, of, 19, of Dartmouth residents, for example, um, like yourselves uh, today, um, uh, with uh, uh, 1929, um, what you would find is that you really aren't connected. And what I'm going to do is, is I'm just going to pass this around to you, just showing 
how you're not connected, I'll oh. pass around three. So what we have, first of all, I'm passing around, is the uh, streetcar routes that had been in operation as of 1929. And there were 20 routes in all that are connected from Clark's Cove all the way to Freetown. Um, then the second, that's trolley cars, and the second one is showing the railroad lines, trolley lines, and boat lines that actually went from um, New Bedford to New York City. Uh, so it was incredibly connected. And then here's a sort of sad example today of what you have for public transportation. <laughs> so, Thank you. Wow. Wow. Yeah. So if you want to look at the evolution of the, of the, of the chicken industry, for example, it started out with these, with these smaller coops. Family run, everyone had chickens, they were all pretty much, people were self-sufficient. And then what happened, uh, this is on Horsemeck Road, is it started building up as they, it became very profitable um, uh, to raise chickens for eggs. And if the two-story chicken coops that you see, those were for the Rhode Island bred chickens. The one-story were for the meat birds. Um, so this is Mrs. Mr. Lemus. Now, this might look familiar to you, maybe not. Um, this is the King Poultry Farm. And uh, that is the, 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 what looks like the two family is not. You see that with the double chimneys there? Mm -hmm. um, and that was the former inn and stagecoach stop um, uh, for the, uh, the stagecoach that ran from New Bedford to Little Compton at one time. The barn is gone at back where they used to stable the horses. But this is UMass Dartmouth campus. Wow. There were three to four of these farms on site. And what's interesting about this is that it has a, a, a pretty amazing um, a back story to it. The King Farm. Well, the King Farm raised chickens to the table on land that had been absorbed by the University of Massachusetts on Old Westport Road. It was originally run as a dairy farm before World War II. Son, Donald H. King, convinced his father that raising poultry meat birds and turkeys would be more profitable than milk. At first, they hatched their own chicks in the basement and root cellar of their historic home on Old Westport Road. As the business grew, they purchased day-old white Cornish cross cockerel chicks from a hatchery in Hudson, New Hampshire, which arrived in New Bedford by train. The young rooster capets were injected with estrogen hormones to neuter them so that their energy went to eating, drinking, and gaining weight. A capet would weigh 13 to 14 pounds in 15 weeks. Castrated capons, by contrast, increased in weight to 16 pounds. Undoctored broilers were marketed at 5 to 7 pounds in 8 weeks. White Cornish cross chickens were prepared to minimize the unsaleable dark pin feathers on the skin. At first, movable small peaked roofed chicken coops, which I showed you before, were built to accommodate the growing free range chickens. However, uh, with World War II, the Army contracted with the King family to supply live birds, and long single story coops were constructed on the King farm, the best farm, um, Joe uh, DeVoe farm, and Tony Sora's farm to supply 150 to 160 thousand meat birds <coughs> through the war years. Grains were planted along the long coops to encourage foraging, and grain and fresh water and electric lights were installed within the coops for 24-hour feeding. Um, at 4 a.m., um, one Manchester slaughterhouse trailer truck and two Capianos truck, uh, trucking tra tractor trailer trucks would arrive after being weighted, uh, weighed in empty, and, uh, in empty at mellow sand and gravel pits platform scale, which is across the way from UMass Dartmouth. The birds were shepherded to the loading dock side of the coops and forced into hinged catching pens where the chickens would be captured by the legs in groups of four and handed up to another to hand to the truck trucker who placed them in wooden crates that held 20 to 30, five to seven pound broilers or five to six capons weighing 16 pounds. The crated chickens would be trucked to slaughter and shipped to Camp Edwards on Cape Cod. The Army said that the farmers was allowed to make a living, but not a profit. 
uh, to supply the war effort. The loaded trucks would be weighed full at mellow sand and gravel pits platform scale, and the difference in weight would pay 30 to 35 cents per pound to cover costs. 36 to 37 cents per pound to allow the farmers to make a profit on the sale of his birds. Mm -hmm. After the war, uh, the King Farm trucked robust chickens to the kosher market in New York City. 500 to 1,000 culls of Campbell's soup chickens hurt during the capture with broken legs while less healthy birds are purchased by the Chinese restaurants in New Bedford for 10 to 12 cents per pound uh, to cover the blue seal feed costs. And as, as each coop was emptied, the manure shavings would be raked out of the coop and picked up by the dairy farmers for their pastures. Donald C. Kank explained, cows refuse to eat grass fertilized by their own excrement. Yet, they will eat pasture grasses fertilized with chicken manure and wood shavings. Once cleaned, uh, the coop would then be washed out and disinfected. Then loads of sand would be brought to the farm from mellow sand and gravel pit to spread on the coop floors for scratch and pebbles used by the chickens to digest the grains in their crop. The sand would then be covered with sawdust and wood shavings cleaned out of the Loom Construction Company chutes. They actually went to the sawmills and Donald was saying, it was the dirtiest job I ever did in my life because uh, they would literally clean out these chutes of, of, of all the sh shavings from the making of the looms which required very, very thin straps of wood uh, mm -hmm. cut to specification. Um, um, and this was used to, uh, to construct silk and rayon, rayon weaving looms. They were long wooden reeds, they were dry, they were plain, they were shaped to weave silk and rayon in the textile mills of Fall, New Bedford and Fall River through the 1960s. By then, the textile and poultry industries were moving south. The cost of heating and electrifying the coops were, were um, prohibitive. The poultry industries could no longer compete. The farmers had to adapt to a changing market structure um, or sell their land to developers during the real estate boom for houses as Dartmouth and Westport became suburbanized on the South Coast. So what do we do about it? Um, here you have Vince and Elizabeth Frary. They're at Cobacut Farms and, in Dartmouth, and that's Donald um, King um, in the cowboy hat speaking to them. And what's interesting about this is that um, uh, Vincent uh, has a, a, a degree in wildlife management biology. Elizabeth studied environmental science and education. Both come from family farming backgrounds. Um, Elizabeth's own family uh, have the E.L. Sylvia Farm and Orchard as uh, in a multi-generational family farm. Now what's interesting is that the, the family has once again passed along this oral history, and um, it's it helped them to keep the farm intact. Also, this was land that was taken by the town of Dartmouth, and so with the um, uh, farmers today, it is prohibitively expensive to operate um, uh, a farm. So in this case, you get agricultural exemptions, uh, you get uh, tax breaks that allow you to keep the property in farming, plus you have multi-generation uh, uh, of farming farmers who help as family members for free labor, otherwise it's prohibitive. So what you have here is uh, Vincent and his little boy collecting Rhode Island red eggs, and um, uh, and next, we go into the, uh, the dairy operation. <coughs> and um, uh, what's, what's interesting, I should, I should just mention, is that uh, Vincent and their family are trying very hard to continue the farming operations here. And uh, they're growing something, they're, they're raising 1,500 Rhode <coughs> Island red laying hens. They have 2,100 Cornish crop broilers and 400 broad-breasted white turkey poles that they grow for um, the Thanksgiving market. Um, and if you were to try an organic chicken and compare it to a Purdue chicken, there's absolutely no comparison. Um, what you have is the taste of honey and the, um, I'll just bring this for you, and, and 
an incredible quality that you just can't perceive unless you've tried it. With the Jerry, I'm just going to take you through because I think we're running running late here. Um, you're dealing with the largest industry on the South Coast was Jerry, and this is Gulf Hill Jerry. Um, but today it's a museum quality. It's a museum essentially. It has. Um, it's no longer profitable to um, to keep. Uh, dairy cars uh, because as the Santos brothers in Westport, Maine Road will tell you, um, they are paid um, $20 per 100 weight of milk. It costs them $25 to produce 100 weight of milk. They lose $5 for every 100 pounds of milk that they produce. So what they have to do is they have to channel the milk into Carl Santos's operation, which is called uh, the Shy Brothers cheese. Here's Carl making Clomage, which is a French style cheese. And what Carl did is, is he, he joined forces with a very savvy um, lady who was into marketing. And um, they developed this by going to France and finding out how it was done. Mm -hmm. And uh, so they make Annabelle's named after the Shy Brothers uh, mother um, in rosemary and classic French and lavender bottom and shallot. And uh, they also make a mozzarella, mm -hmm. and they uh, they make the clamage, and they won, which is interesting, top awards, and are now being listed in the top cheese shop in New York City, and their wares are farmed out to um, that's Murray's uh, cheese shop at 254 Bleecker Street, New York City, um, and they. They are farming out the cheeses to top restaurants such as Breslin and uh, Daniel and Perla and Dutch restaurants, and they're using it in incredibly um, inventive ways. So what the Shy Brothers have done is they've added value to the milk to keep the farm um, operation running. And I'll, I'll close off the uh, the slides with. Um, Andrew Perry of Pine Hill Dairy, and what he has is raw milk. Um, raw milk you can sell for eight to ten dollar gallons, a dollars per gallon. And for people who are, are allergic to milk um, the products, uh, raw milk without the pasteurization, homogenization is actually um, um, for being drinking or uh, drunk by lactose intolerant people. And it supposedly has more health values. And to add value, further value, he's going to par up or team up with his cousins um, who have the Golden Rope Robin um, fruit stands on Horseneck Road to make a fruit yogurt. So that's, that's the hope. So what you're seeing here is um, of the farmers who are trying to get a fair price for their product so they can cover their costs and they can afford to support a family, which is hard to do these days um, when they're competing with factory farms in the Midwest, for example, who are heavily subsidized. So, so that is, a, is an edited version, if you like, of a larger. You can come to the exhibit, which I think is going to be, I think, a TV Shags gallery in February and March. Um, if you're around um, for uh, farmers and fishers, portraits, words, and tools. Thank you. Thank you.